Hi, everyone, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today, we're excited to have Lindsay James present Learning from Nature, Biomimicry, and Conservation. Um, so to start off, um, I'm Lee Munger, SCV's Marketing Communications Manager, and I just wanted to go over a few uh, ground rules. So everyone will be muted during the whole presentation, but we do still want you guys to be able to ask questions. Uh, so just type them into the chat box and I'll be reading them out at the end for Lindsay to answer. Uh, the presentation will be around 30 to 45 minutes long and then whatever remaining time we have will be for questions. So just a little bit about Lindsay um, to get this started. Lindsay James is an expert in the field of sustainability specializing in biomimicry. In addition to instructing for Arizona State University's Biomimicry Center, she works with the Biomimicry Institute, coaching biomimicry startups. She now serves on the leadership team for one of these startups, Nucleado, in a, a Brazilian company dedicated to restoring native forests. In her tenure, Lindsay's professional experience includes serving on the executive management team for Interface, a global manufacturer of floor coverings. Lindsay earned her MS in Biomimicry from Arizona State University, and she graduated from the University of North Carolina with an MBA and a BA in both economics and biology. So now I'll go ahead and hand it over to Lindsay. Thank you so much, Lee, and I really appreciate the invitation. So I, I am honored to be here speaking to all of you today. And um, as Lee mentioned, uh, the majority of my experience is in corporate. So while uh, Lee did mention that I do have an undergraduate degree in biology, I'm not a biologist. I'm much more of a business person. And in my 10 plus years at Interface, I, um, at the end of my tenure, I held the position. I was on the executive team leading the sustainability division of the America's business uh, within Interface. But since 2017, I've been focused on biomimicry and the commercialization of biomimetic innovations. And as I mentioned, I am just incredibly honored and thrilled to be here today. So thank you. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we're living in a very um, stressful and scary time. And so um, there's a lot of suffering right now in the world. And um, I appreciate all of you taking time out to be here today. I know that it's um, there's a lot of disruption at this moment. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides. I think I need to share my screen here. Voila. So uh, the topic of my speech today is learning from nature, biomimicry, and conservation. And what we're going to talk about, this is uh, the outline for today, we're going to, I'm going to introduce the concept of biomimicry and really talk about the three elements of biomimicry. And those are going to provide the framework for the rest of my talk. I'm also going to touch on this idea that life creates condi conditions conducive to life and how critical that is. Then as I go into one of the three elements, emulate, I will share some product innovation, process innovation, organizational design innovation. Then I'll talk about reconnect, uh, specifically biophilia, and the ethos of biomimicry. And I will share a case study representing all three of these elements, and then we'll close. And I do want to take a moment to say thank you to the Biomimicry Institute and Biomimicry 3.8. These are sister organizations and they are global leaders in the practice of biomimicry. I work with both of them. I received my training from, Biom from Biomimicry 3.8, and so I want to extend my gratitude to these organizations. So what is biomimicry? And biomimicry has um, many different definitions, and the one that I really like to share is that it is consciously learning from nature's genius. So really going out and consciously learning how does nature solve these problems and how could we learn from that? And um, biomimicry for me fuels my optimism. It is one of the most optimistic design methodologies that I've encountered uh, specific for the world of sustainability. And when I first came across biomimicry about 15 years ago, I was amazed. I said, wow, this is, this is genius. Nature is genius and the solutions exist. We have so many intractable problems, seemingly intractable problems in our world today, and the solutions exist. Many of these problems, other life on this planet have also faced, um, has also faced, and recognizing that other life on this planet shares the same context that we share. And so there's much that we can learn. And it really is remembering that we aren't the only species. This is one of the most basic aspects of biomimicry is 
recognizing that there are so many other species on the planet. Um, in 2011, that estimate was 8.7 million other species. And I was really surprised to read a study in 2016 that vastly expanded this estimate to 1 trillion. So now that we're beginning to really understand the microbiome and all of these microbes, um, then that number has jumped up uh, by many orders of scale. So it's very exciting to see that we're not alone. And remembering that we aren't the only species is really um, one of the key distinctions of biomimicry um, versus other bio-inspired design. And so the three elements of biomimicry really, um, and, and as I mentioned, this is how I'm going to frame my talk today, and it's a fundamental framework in the practice of biomimicry. And these three elements um, really do help distinguish biomimicry from bio-inspired design. And so I'm going to use some of the B3.8 language uh, to describe these elements. The ethos element really forms the essence of our ethics, our intentions, and our underlying philosophy for why we practice biomimicry. Hi, Lindsay. I'm sorry to interject really quickly, uh, but could you put your presentation on present mode? Because I think some people are having um, issues. Sorry about that. So it's currently in present mode. Um, but I could switch over to PDF if that. That might, um, that might be better. Okay. I am glad you. Yes. So. Let's see. Okay. So that looks better. Um, all right, great, thank you. Is there, um, do you know which button I click to make this fill up my whole screen or? Uh, the way, um, hmm. here it is. Let's see if this works. Oh uh, yeah, that looks much better. Uh, yeah, perfect, thank you so much. Okay, absolutely. And so um, the ethos element, as I was mentioning, this represents our respect for and responsibility to and really our gratitude to our fellow species and our home. The reconnect element is about regaining understanding and recognition that people and nature are deeply intertwined. We are nature. So reconnecting is a practice and a mindset that explores and deepens this relationship between humans and everything else on the planet. And the emulate element is really the first introduction to biomimicry for many people. And this represents bringing the principles, patterns, strategies, and functions found in nature to inform our designs. So if you Google, Google biomimicry, for example, this is the element that you will see. These are the innovations. This is really the, the poster child of biomimicry in many ways. And what I aspire to demonstrate today is how these three elements represent pathways to conservation. So for the Society of Conservation Biologists, I thought this would be the most interesting aspect of biomimicry for you is to share how these different elements really can lead to greater efforts in conservation or greater interest in conservation. So I aspire for this to be clear by the end of my time today. And this quote from John Dingle resonates with me and resonates with many biomimics that living wild species are like a library, library of books still unread, and our heedless destruction of them is akin to burning the library without ever having read the books. And so I, I do hope that biomimicry can motivate more people to see the truth in this. And one other aspect of biomimicry that many of us practice is quieting our human cleverness. And I think this quote from Einstein really does represent um, how, how humble we should be in front of nature's genius, that we still do not know one thousandth of one percent of what nature has revealed to us. And this quieting our human cleverness is a key aspect in the biomimicry design process, innovation process. And it's a good practice for any design and innovation process, which is really creating space between identifying the problem and jumping to a solution. So when we quiet our cleverness, we don't just jump right away to knowing the answer. We actually take some time, take the space that's required for these ideas to really 
evolve and for us to truly learn from nature's processes. And as I mentioned in the outline, life creates conditions to life, conducive to life. This is a critical phrase within biomimicry. And to help you understand this phrase, I would love to engage in a thought experiment. So if you will please imagine the earth when it formed 4.6 billion years ago. And it was probably something like this, just really inhospitable, um, molten lava, you might imagine. And now, if you will please imagine the Earth today. And this is one example of one of the many beautiful ecosystems on our planet. And so when we think about, wow, what happened in that 4.6 billion year history to get from what Earth, how Earth was formed to what we have today. And um, there are competing theories about the presence of water. So water is uh, one of the really obvious differences. Um, there actually are some theories today that say that water was present when Earth was formed or that it arrived around 4.4 billion years ago through an asteroid or a comet. Um, but roughly 3.8 billion years ago, life mysteriously appeared and persisted. And so that is still something that we don't, that is a beautiful mystery. And over billions of years, life has shaped its surroundings to be even more conducive for more life. So some examples, photosynthesis um, over billions of years converted the predominantly uh, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which was mostly nitrogen, it still is, but the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere into oxygen and sunlight into chemical energy, which opened doors, of course, for all the aerobic organisms. And the Cambrian explosion was possibly enabled by the formation of the ozone layer to protect multicellular, complex multicellular life from ultraviolet radiation. And microbes and fungus transformed rock substrates into soil, providing fertile ground for terrestrial life and plants. And food webs balanced predators and prey and mutualisms of all kind evolved, uh, creating even more environmental niches for diversity to flourish. So it really is amazing how life creates conditions conducive to life. And life has survived and thrived for billions of years through adaptation and evolution, continually shaping the surrounding environment. So species are self-serving and still generous at the systems level, shaping the surrounding environment to support all life, um, with, of course, Homo sapiens being a notable example, uh, exception to this. And life creates conditions to life. This is an emergent property of the complex adaptive system of life. Life is interconnected, it's interdependent. These are truths that we know. And at this point, I always love to remember that we are very young as a species. Um, if we estimate, most estimates have Homo sapiens, uh, modern humans, um, around 250,000 years of history, which is just barely a blip on this. So when you think about the whole history of life, and recognize that all of these other organisms that we share the planet with that have persisted, that are still alive today, that are that have survived, they have survived under the same operating context that we share. Uh, they have sunlight as a source of energy, they have gravity, they have water, uh, they have a lot of dynamic non-equilibrium on the planet that they also have to manage and adapt to. There are limits and boundaries, and they leverage the cyclic processes. So the same conditions of life are shared by all the species on the planet. So I'm going to spend some time talking about emulate. And this emulate element, as I mentioned before, represents bringing the principles, patterns, strategies, and functions found in nature to inform design. And in my experience, biomimicry can catalyze this leap from incremental improvement to radical innovation. And just asking the question, how does nature solve this problem? Puts our brains into a totally different space of creativity, really opens up a lot more creativity for, for humans as we practice this. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of emulate and a product example here is the Biometrica DNA Sample Guard. And presently, bio biological materials such as nucleic acids are maintained and transported in a cold chain 
Um, so cold environments having to be refrigerated. And that has, that's not a very resilient system and it's very costly in terms of energy. And so um, Biometrica now has developed this DNA sample guard that can stabilize and protect biological materials at room temperature without degradation. And this technology was designed by combining extremophile biology uh, that an extremophile biology looking at the processes that allow these organisms, such as the tardigrade that you see here on the slide, um, that allows these organisms to survive in extreme environments. Uh, and then combining that with synthetic chemistry. So the tardigrade here is a real hero, a real champion of extremophile biology. This is the first known animal to survive exposure to space. So the tardigrade is about 0.5 millimeters. It's not a very big animal. Um, and of course, not 100% of the samples survived uh, in this experiment, but some of them did survive. That's more than um, any other animal has ever been able to survive in open space. And the tardigrade uh, goes into the, uses this process. It goes into what um, we think of as hibernation. It's not actually hibernation. It's anhydrobiosis. So it goes into this desiccated state, but it preserves all of its DNA in this anhydrobiosis process by actually the DNA gets shrink wrapped almost in, um, in sugars. And so Biometrica has emulated that and using synthetic chemistry can now preserve DNA, um, as I mentioned, without any refrigeration. So a truly remarkable innovation. And another um, example that I'll share with you is from my former employer, Interface. And this is uh, really was Interface's first introduction to biomimicry. Um, Interface had brought on some biomimicry consultants, uh, the forerunner of what is what is now Biomimicry 3.8, and took the team of designers, David Oki, the lead designer and his team, and went out into nature and said, let's look at what happens to ground and nature, floor coverings in nature. And one of the key inspirations was recognizing that there's this beautiful organized chaos in nature. There are never any two leaves that are exactly the same. There isn't this this, I, I, this attachment to identical pieces is really a human um, perception of perfection. And so when Interface began to release that and say, what if we made every single carpet tile? So up on the top, you'll see traditional carpet. That's actually broad loom carpet, but patterned carpet tile was uh, the dominant product at the time. But what if we release that and said, we don't need to have the same pattern on every tile over and over again? What if instead each tile was intentionally different? What would that look like? And so David Oki and the Interface team actually really brought this to life in an, in an amazing way. And what now has happened is that some of the benefits of this innovation um, are that there's much less off quality because we've released this human-based de definition of perfection and no longer assume that every tile needs to be exactly the same. It's okay to have some variation, and actually it's intentional to have some variation. So that reduced the off quality, which reduced the raw material cost. Also, it reduces raw material cost because you no longer have um, this idea that's in textiles about having dye lots. So you may not know that you never actually get the exact same color twice. You actually have dye lots, these giant lots of textiles that are produced. But when it came to producing these kind of textiles, like carpet tile, you would actually have to maintain a dye lot inventory. So it actually reduced costs for the consumer as well because they no longer needed to maintain their inventory of dye lots. Um, and then also for the consumer, it's much easier to install a non-directional, non-patterned carpet tile. It's like a puzzle where every piece, every piece fits. So you can take off a corner here and actually it fits over there just fine. So it's, it's really been a revolution within the carpet tile industry, and it's had great financial benefits for Interface as well as the sustainability benefits that I've already mentioned. And this innovation led to Interface pursuing biomimicry and still pursuing biomimicry as a source of innovation. And David Oki and Ray Anderson, uh, who set up an, a foundation, Ray Anderson Foundation, um, and David Oki are both very big supporters of biomimicry to this day. So another example is Sharklet Technologies. This is another emulate example. And within this emulate, um, within this example, you can see on the bottom right corner here is the actual innovation. So Sharklet Technologies produces a synthetic surface 
that's inspired by the skin of sharks and it actually deters colonization by certain disease causing microbes. So it uh, doesn't work against viruses, but it does work against a lot of different types of bacteria. And it's actually a really interesting um, innovation. It's based on this impression of shark skin. So if you look on the top right, you'll see a scanning electron microscope view of what a shark skin actually looks like. And so that was emulated with these um, different diamond patterns. And, it's, uh, and using the shark was based on the observation that sharks actually are the only slow moving marine animal that don't have a lot of growth, um, what's called fouling. So uh, algae, um, plants, um, and even uh, fouling includes even small animals that can end up on these um, different surfaces and marine environments that then inhibit the function. And so the surface, surface topography is made of these millions of microscopic diamonds um, within the sharklet product that disrupt the ability for bacteria to aggregate, to colonize, and to develop into biofilms. So it's really a surface uh, that bacteria doesn't like to grow on. And thinking about this, so the applications are numerous, of course, um, high touch, bacteria prone surfaces, hot in hospitals, public restrooms, childcare. Um, and because this artificial surface works without killing the microbes, there's no selection for resistance, which is really important in today's world when we have um, so much overuse of antibiotics and other kill strategies that have created these superbugs. So this does not contribute to that. And I'm going to share some examples of other innovations too, um, because you can apply this emulate principle, this element of biomimicry to process as well. And so one famous example for thinking about how to improve our processes based on nature would be the circular economy. And the circular economy, uh, nature has informed many of the circular economy practices. And I'm going to use one specific example, again, another interface example, so networks is inspired by nature's recycling. Because really, when we look in nature, the recycling happens in many different loops. So there are tight loops and then more expanded loops. So a tree that falls in the forest doesn't necessarily go back into being a leaf, uh, sorry, a leaf that falls from a tree in a forest, in a deciduous forest, is not gonna turn into another leaf again. It's going to be used for other materials. But uh, the chlorophyll within that tree is actually recycled within the tree itself. So that chlorophyll gets of course, um, saved over the course of the winter and is reused again. The nitrogen is reused again. So there are tight loops and then there are larger loops. And so Interface was really wondering about how can we recycle more of our carpet? We weren't, Interface was not receiving enough old carpet tile back to generate all of the nylon that's needed. And began looking for other sources of nylon. And that's when, um, through a serendipitous occasion, realized that these fishing nets and a, and a partnership was formed with the Zoological Society of London to collect these fishing nets that are discarded and in areas like the Philippines and Cameroon, they are now collecting these fishing nets that otherwise were contributing to ghost fishing. And so now these fishing nets can come back to Aquafil, the supplier of the nylon, and that can actually recycle that into carpet tile nylon. So a very successful program and since 2012, 224 tons of fishing wet nets have been collected. And this has now helped uh, 2,200 families. And another area that I'd like to talk about in terms of emulate would be organizational design. So if we look at organizational design and what can we learn from nature in terms of how we design our organizations. And there's a lot that we can learn in terms of resilience. So really recognizing that disturbance is inevitable and we can learn from nature and how to be more resilient. And this is a model, the adaptive cycle is a model that uh, was pioneered by Buzz Holling, Professor Holling. And um, thinking about resilience, it's important to remember uh, that we're talking about resilience in ecological terms. So not the engineering definition of resilience in terms of bouncing back, but the ecological definition, which is maintaining the function of the system um, after a disruption. And this model uh, here that I'm showing you, the adaptive cycle, was derived from the comparative study of dynamics and ecosystems. And we see that this is true, this pattern of change is true in all complex adaptive systems. So from cells 
all the way up to the planet itself. And it's also true in human systems and social systems, which is, of course, also a complex adaptive system. And what I find interesting, there are many interesting things about this model. Uh, one of the things is that look at there are two different loops. So there's a back loop and a for loop. And so here is the for loop. And um, when we look at going through exploitation, which is also referred to as rapid growth, all the way up to conservation. And many of us have heard about um, the succession that we see in ecosystems. So that was really what was initially studied in a lot of ecological science is really focusing on what we call that for loop. But the back loop, this, this turn here where we go into, there's inevitably some sort of disturbance. It's also called release. So the omega phase and then coming up to reorganization. That back loop is where we can learn a lot from nature. How do ecosystems navigate this change? And it's important to recognize that time is not represented on this at all. So, and really the for loop is, is usually much more gradual, it's much slower, and the back loop is very quick. And <clears throat> so the different types of change characterize these for and back loops. Um, and again, a lot of times in this back loop, it can be very abrupt. So disturbance, nobody can predict exactly when a disturbance will happen. And right now we're living in an, during a huge disturbance. And what is, one of the things about this disturbance right now is that it's actually affecting every aspect of the system at all the different levels. So from individual to family to community, all the way up through globally, this is affecting us. And so it's one of the few times um, that we've ever seen a panarchy and a panarchy is how these loops all nest together. And within a panarchy, everything happening, um, everything going through a disturbance at the same time. And a couple of the lessons um, that I rely on here is that disturbance precedes renewal. So sometimes you hear that you have to let go to grow. And it's true in nature that, that there has to be space. If, if there is going to be renewal, there has to be the space created for that. And one of the ideas uh, that we've learned about resilience is that we have to have diversity. Diversity is a key to enabling resilience in ecosystems, <clears throat> biodiversity especially. Uh, redundancy, so there have to be multiple species that perform the same ecosystem function. And decentralization, and uh, humans are not very good yet at decentralization. We're learning a lot about it, and we are um, just establishing more and more systems that are more highly decentralized. But those are three keys uh, to resilience within nature. And biomimicry is not necessarily going to help us when it comes to thinking about the current uh, crisis that we're all experiencing. Biomimicry is not necessarily going to help us find a vaccine, for example, but it can help with understanding and navigating our current challenges and creating innovative solutions. So emulate, I believe, is a pathway to conservation by Biomimicry helps to provide additional motivation. Um, and that's really what I've seen with a lot of organizations as they have found these amazing innovations in nature, then are more interested in pursuing biomimicry and also protecting this wealth of information that is there, this innovation potential that exists in nature. So now let's talk about reconnect. And this is a lesser known aspect of the practice of biomimicry. And uh, as I had read before from B3.8's language, the reconnect element is about regaining the understanding and recognition. I had not, I had not anticipated that my battery in my PC is actually going to start to run low. So I, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. We'll just all have to laugh about my rookie mistake here. So here we go. Yay for rookies. <laughs> and so uh, reconnect is about
Hello? <clears throat> Hello? Um, we can hear you. We just okay. can't see, um, see your video in the corner. Okay, great. Then I will... Um, I'm getting this... Do you still happen to see the slide by chance? Um, we can, but it's not in full um, full screen view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, I don't know if you heard me saying, let's have a, you know, might as well have a rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> so here I am. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so let's just pick up where we were. Reconnect, remember, remembering that we are nature. And as I was, uh, again, I will use the language that B3.8 uses here. It's really about regaining the understanding and the recognition that people and nature are deeply intertwined. Reconnecting is a practice and a mindset that explores and deepens this relationship between humans and the rest of nature. And one thing about these three elements is that they all amplify each other. So as people begin to practice emulate, then they actually reconnect with nature more. Or as they practice reconnect, then they have creative inspiration that can begin to emulate and ethos that I'll get into. <clears throat> and so when I think about reconnect, I really like to think about this openness to nature's genius. And <clears throat> that by connecting with nature, we are better equipped to understand the natural genius surrounding us and thus capture and apply these innovative strategies. Nature adapts in context is one of the adages that we say a lot in biomimicry. And every, every natural strategy we witness evolved in the context of its habitat. So reconnection helps us recognize the importance of this context and really recognize the difference in context that we may experience around the planet and that our innovations need to be able to hold up to around the planet. And also, I find that reconnect really opens up systems thinking. So especially um, when we use biomimicry in schools and, and education, we see that it's a great pathway for systems thinking and recognizing the interconnections and interdependencies that we all share. So it really does help people be more open to nature's genius. And right now, the Biomimicry Institute is offering 30 days of reconnection. So I re if you're now that we're all sort of sheltered in place, and as you can see here, the language from their website, have we ever had such a moment? A moment for a forced collective pause. And so this offers different activities to really structure your reconnect moments. And hopefully all of you are having a chance to enjoy some nature. And I also like to think about reconnect in terms of evolutionary programming. Um, and, and sound is one of these fascinating pathways uh, to reconnecting with our own inherent biology, that we are biological organisms and that we evolved in contact with nature. And sound is uh, one of our 360 degree senses. I read recently that we don't have ear lids, which I thought was really clever and cute. So we don't have ear lids. It's, it's really tough for us to, to plug out sound. Um, and I'm going to read a quote from Julian Treasure, who is uh, a leading expert in acoustic theory. And he talks about how sound affects us physiologically. He says, because hearing is your primary warning sense, a sudden sound will start a process. It releases cortisol and increases your heart rate and breathing. And this is because we've been programmed over hundreds of thousands of years to assume that any sudden or unexplained sound is a threat. And your body gets ready to fight or flee. So even though we know that a backfire, car backfiring is not dangerous, it nevertheless puts us into this state. So this is a really interesting aspect of reconnect to recognize um, that we are we are nature and we have a lot of these um, evolutionary programming, as I like to call it. And so one uh, tool that I like to share with you that I use a lot is Nature Space. Um, this is a uh, an amazing collection of very high quality recordings of nature. Um, they call it holographic audio, as you can see here. So um, as we're all sheltering in place and maybe you're hearing, you know, more video games than you ever have heard during your work day, for example, I'm not speaking from personal experience, of course, uh, but maybe, maybe you can use nature space um, to help you concentrate and reconnect even when you're at your desk and in front of a computer.
But also another thought experiment here with reconnect, which is imagine your ideal workplace and really imagine it with all of your senses. Really imagine what does it feel like when you walk in there? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What, what really, what is your ideal workplace? And for those of us in offices, um, is this what you imagine as your ideal workplace? Is this probably not? I don't imagine that many of you thought of this cube farm as your ideal working environment. And biophilic design is really recognizing that we are healthier. So this may be more of what you're imagining. And biophilic design is a relatively, um, it's an ancient practice in many ways, but also now, uh, like a lot of ancient practices, is be we're beginning to recognize the genius within it. And that it's a discipline in architecture intending to deliver the benefits of our contact with nature while also fostering a stronger human nature connection. So it's really about better design, creating spaces that help us feel comfortable at a very deep level and recognizing that we are healthier and our cognitive abilities improve when we are in, in nature and also when we have these reminders of nature in our spaces that we occupy. And it's more than just uh, bringing trees into the space. Um, it's really about creating spaces that have daylight and moving air and changing light and variations. And it's all recognizing that humans evolved in contact with nature. So in our 250,000 year history as a species, humans migrated out of, Afri out of Africa and 60,000 years ago. So when you look at this whole scan, just imagine that our, look at how brief of a blip of time that we have been separating ourselves from nature. And evolution, as you know, works very slowly. It works over multiple generations. And so we have, our evolutionary history is rooted in nature. And so the evidence, as we look at this for biophilic design, and a lot of the initial evidence was done in healthcare settings, as pictured here, also in educational settings, but we see improved stress recovery rates, improved cognitive function, including mental, uh, including mental stamina and focus. We're in better moods. We have, we can learn better, we have lower blood pressure. So a lot of this is also tied in with attention restoration theory. Attention restoration theory uh, was brought to light by Rachel Kaplan and Stephen Kaplan. I encourage you to check out that body of research and also the Children in Nature Network. So they are related, but not directly related. So the Children in Nature Network has promoted a lot of research about green schoolyards and also green schools and really recognizing that our children can benefit so much from having improved contact with nature. And uh, the attention restoration theory focuses on the restoration of diminished attentional capacity. And what I find really interesting here is the distinction between directed attention and effortless attention. And effortless attention, which is also referred to as soft fascination, can really help us re reboot and really boost our directed attention. So I love this quote, anything we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. Ray Anderson used to say that a lot. It's also um, an ancient quote. Um, Chief Seattle also used to, uh, has been, this quote has been attributed to him. And I believe that biophilic design holds the promise of embedding this reminder in every space we create. So it really can help bring a lot of humans closer to nature and reconnecting with nature. And I believe that biophilic design enhances reconnect and that reconnect enhances our conservation efforts. And that biomimicry can help us appreciate how much we depend upon nature, how completely and totally we depend upon nature for our mental and physical health. And so moving into the ethos uh, part here, and the ethos element, again, reading from Biomimicry 3.8, it really forms the essence of our ethics and our attentions and our underlying practice, our underlying philosophy for why we practice biomimicry. And life creates conditions to life. This, at a systems level, life is not sustainable. It's regenerative. And I, I love how now more and more areas are recognizing the need for humans to also contribute to regeneration and healing our planet. And when we think about how life creates conditions conducive to life, we can actually look at ourselves and say, are humans creating conditions conducive to life? And this is a tragic picture, which is so emblematic of our society today. 
And when I look at things like this, I, I find it very important to remember that this is not inevitable. This is not inevitable. We can change. And in terms of organizations, when you can really bring in this deeper ethics into an organization, then you can unlock a lot of passion. And as Simon Sinek, who authored The Power of Why, has a great TED Talk, he says that working hard for something that we don't care about is stress. Working hard for something we love is called passion. And so at the organizational level, I have seen, um, I've actually seen that employees really care more deeply about the success of the organization. And they bring their best effort and really their whole selves. They bring their creativity. They're not just sitting there and thinking about what they're going to do at five o'clock when they get to go home. They're actually really involved in helping the organization solve problems because they're committed to the goals of the organization because those goals are about the ethics, about creating a better world. And <clears throat> now what we see today is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is offering a great template of, of what these goals could look like for different organizations. So many organizations are aligning with these and these are a collection of 17 goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. So these were set in 2015 with the goal of achieving them by 2030. And the Biomimicry Institute has several programs. Here I'm going to highlight two of them, the Launchpad and the Ray of Hope Prize that are helping to accelerate these biomimicry startups and they are explicitly focused on the sustainable design goals from the UN. And I'm going to read a couple of quotes here. Uh, one of my colleagues from the Biomimicry Institute, Michelle Graves, said that we want to help these innovators incorporate the sustainability ethos of biomimicry into all of their future designs and to understand the importance of context and connectivity in nature as well as in their businesses. And Beth Ratner, who is the executive director of the Biomimicry Institute, uh, speaking on whether or not an innovation is biomimetic or bioinspired, she says that the most simple and straightforward test may simply be to see how compatible it is with all sur surrounding living systems, not just serving humans. Is a problem promoting ecological diversity? Is it safe? Are more things like soil and water healthy and alive because of it? So it's this explicit commitment to creating designs that are well adapted to our ecosystems that sets biomimicry apart. And so two of the alumni that have come from these programs, one is Watchtower Robotics. Um, and so I'm gonna actually looking at time, I'm gonna go a little bit faster here, but Watchtower Robotics is, has developed this really cool robot that can actually go into our pipes and identify, locate exactly where leaks are. I had not realized until I came across this company that it's very hard. A lot of times we don't know where the leaks are in our water systems until we have a sinkhole, until we have a big problem. And so this watchtower, um, this scouting robot can go into the water systems and emulating um, different aspects of the blind cave fish, of the moon jellyfish and the octopus can actually identify these leaks and then communicate that to a computer so that then we can find the leaks and patch them before they're a big problem. And another uh, alumni from the program, Wearable, is a, has, I find a really fascinating um, idea about actually creating textiles and fibers without using harmful dyes or pigments. So these that you see on the bottom are created um, with structural color and actually programming the DNA uh, within um, different microbes that can then produce these, uh, these fibers. So they're protein fibers. Because they're protein fibers, they're actually compostable and uh, so then have a circular life cycle as well. So this helps, helps us move from the linear life cycle of a lot of our products to the circular economy. And finally, I'm going to share, um, so I do believe that the ethos aspect of biomimicry does help contribute to conservation because biomimicry solutions are inherently sustainable. So I'm going to quickly uh, step through a case study of all three of these elements in action. And um, so Nucleaudio, as Lee mentioned, is an organization that I serve on the leadership team with, and it's based in Brazil, and it's all about restoring native forest. So this is a really interesting example because we're learning from nature to help conserve nature, to help reforest, restore our native forest. And so um, I had not known uh, that the challenges with 
restoration and forest restoration are actually not purely political. They're actually really tough. So even though it looks inter easy, um, it actually has many challenges. And um, to restore these forests actually takes three years of maintenance. And the three years of maintenance includes quarterly application of herbicides and pesticides, irrigation as well. And so it's a very, very arduous task. And even with all of that intervention, there's still a 30% mortality rate for these seedlings. And so nucleotide, I'll go through each of the three elements, but nucleotide began by emulating these different functions in nature. And uh, we can't talk about forest restoration without looking at seeds, is one of the, as one of the co-founders likes to say. So looking at the, this winged seed and really understanding how does it have that structure and how can we apply that structure to the design? So having things like, um, how the, what we call air bones and really creating and leveraging the structure of that. And then the tank bromeliad is a champion at collecting and capturing accumulating water. So that formed a lot of the innovation inspiration for actually holding on to the water because in a lot of our tropical, of course, a lot of our tropical ecosystems have highly variable rainfall. So there are wet seasons and dry seasons. So this allows for the seedling to have water throughout the dry season as it's collected. And then how does nature protect the soil? And so really recognizing the importance of leaf litter and how that's organized in layers and how it protects the soil, how it slows the rain down. So emulating this design, and we see that this design actually does in this innovation, it actually achieves its intended goals of creating a micro environment for the, each sapling, it's for each tree, to help it really restore and help restore the forest, not just, so when we're restoring forests, it's not, of course, it's not just about the trees, it's about all of the species, especially the microbiome as well. And so these devices are helping to restore the biodiversity. And uh, it's very good data. So we're, we've been partnering with different universities to collect data and really understand that the design is effective in improving the soil moisture. And where there is water, there is life. And so for the reconnect side of this, uh, the two co-founders were raised in the Atlantic rainforest. This is a picture of them in the Atlantic rainforest. They're avid kayakers and they really recognize, so being raised in the Atlantic rainforest, they have this reflex of looking to nature for solutions. But they also recognize the importance of water and forest and that relationship that that systemic thinking, really recognizing that to have healthy water, we need to have healthy forest and vice versa. And also when we think about the reconnect, what one thing I love about this company is that we think of the trees as the users. So when we're going through our business plan and thinking about the users, it's the trees, the seedlings that are the users. It's the, the, the soil that is a user. It's also the field workers and this is all generated by this deep sense of reconnect and really recognizing that it's about the trees. It really is about the trees and about the, and about the field workers and the work that they're doing. And then for the ethos, this mantra, restoring native forests is what guides us. This is what we are all about, is restoring native forest. And at a very deep level and recognizing um, how important nature is in our, in our values. So this is our values statement and nucleatio we hold nature first in everything we do. Our pioneering spirit propels us and we honor true relationships. So this shows you, I hope, um, how much our ethics are grounded in nature and in biomimicry and in sustainability. So let me share some biomimicry resources with you and some closing thoughts here. One of the resources that I encourage you to check out if you're interested in learning more about biomimicry is the Biomimicry Institute, and that's biomimicry.org. And that's where you can find things like the Biomimicry Toolbox and learn about different design aspects and, and ways to practice biomimicry. There's also a website called asknature.org, and that's where you can just type in anything that you're trying to solve, any function. And function is that bridge between biology and design. And so recognizing um, that you can put in different types of challenges. And so here you see, so I was getting to type prevent fractures. So you can type in different challenges and see how has this already 
what do we already know? How has this already been researched in terms of nature strategies? And there's also um, different collections that you can look at on asknature.org. So if you just want to poke around, you can look at how does nature stay clean, um, repel microbes from surfaces, manage soil, different things like that. I also recommend Zygote Quarterly. This is an electronic uh, magazine that is beautifully done. It's also available online. And so I do believe that biomimicry offers these different pathways to conservation through emulate, reconnect, and ethos. And that really biomimicry is about a pathway to nature's genius and bringing more people into understanding the genius that we see in nature. So with that, I would love to hear any questions that may have come in. And again, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was great. Um, so we do have a couple minutes for questions. So if anybody has any, you can go ahead and submit them in the chat box um, and I'll read them out. I do see one right now. Um, does the restoration theory affect retention in students? So the attention restoration theory, I'm sorry, could you? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, the question is, does the restoration theory affect retention in students? Yes, so I have seen some research about that. I don't know at all off the top of my head, um, but yes, I have seen some research about how that really does affect um, memory as well and our ability to retain information. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Let's see. Um, so Tammy wants to know if they can get a copy of your slides. Um, I can answer part of that. This presentation will be uploaded onto our Vimeo channel, so you will be able to um, view the entire presentation there. Great. Yes, and I can, um, I'll have to check. I, I didn't necessarily do a great job at attributing all of the different photographs I use, so I would have to go back. I would like to go back and do that before I shared a copy of my slides. Great, thanks. Um, and then Claire wants to know, um, do you provide a mentorship program? Um, the Biomimicry Institute does, certainly. Yes, yes. Um, okay, hold on, they're coming in quickly. Um, Nuno wants to know, regarding your work, what does Chrysalis Strategies do in practice? So um, right now I'm uh, really helping with different um, opportunities. So I'm doing a lot of contract work um, with different organizations, um, including the Biomimicry Institute and Biomimicry 3.8, and also um, doing a lot of speaking engagements, and I have done some workshops as well. So that is what Crystal Strategies is all about. Thanks. Um, and then can you throw some light on how biomimicry can help circular nature? So can help in terms of, I think. Um, Jiraj, if you could elaborate, that would be great. Hold on, let's see. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, is the Biomimicry Institute only at ASU and how does it differ from Biomimicry 3.8? That's a great question. So Arizona State University is one of the first universities to have a formal um, program, a master's degree in biomimicry. So the Arizona State University has the Biomimicry Center and the, a lot of the staff from Arizona State University's Biomimicry Center have come from Biomimicry 3.8 as well. And so Biomimicry 3.8 and the Biomimicry Institute are sister organizations. They were both co-founded by Janine Binius and Dana Baumeister. And the Biomimicry Institute is the nonprofit arm, and Biomimicry 3.8 is a for profit consultancy. Great, thanks. And then this is um, sort of a follow up, I think, but would the master's program at ASU be best for getting into biomimicry? It's a great route to get into biomimicry. And also, um, there are different, if you go on, I encourage you to look at the Biomimicry Institute for different learning opportunities, there are different workshops. So before jumping into a master's program, you can attend. Uh, one or three day workshop or actually and their immersive experiences as well that I highly recommend. And so when I did my biomimicry professional certification, it was a two year program that involved a lot. Um, so that was on top of the master's degree and that involved going to different ecosystems around the planet and deeply learning from nature and those ecosystems. So 
There are immersion um, workshops that are offered, uh, for example, in Costa Rica. That's one place where I know there are workshops. And so before diving into the master's degree, you can see if this really is for you by doing one of those workshops. Great, thank you. Um, and Mary would like to know, do you see benefit to studying primate behavior when trying to change human behavior, e.g. Um, to make people more likely to engage in sustainable behaviors? Yeah, that can be, that's a really tricky um, and slippery slope. And so when it comes to directly modeling human behavior, there's been a lot of reticence because this is, because it's been abused so much in our history. Um, and so we don't want to, our, it's just, like I said, it's a very slippery slope, but there certainly is a lot that we can learn from looking at how primates, how do primates learn, for example? And so what are some of the ways that we can use and, and borrow ideas from that. Thanks. Um, and then David would like to know, has there been any innovation in the energy sector using biomimicry? Absolutely, yes. Yes, at many different levels. Everything from um, using swarm theory to help us be more efficient on how we manage our different loads, our electrical loads during throughout time. Um, so that has been um, one of the ways, but then everything to actually battery innovation, um, windmill innovation, so yes. Great, um, and then Pedram um, is asking, do we need to have a biology background? I'm so glad you asked because biomimicry is a multidisciplinary practice and so it brings together designers, engineers, business people, and biologists. So biology is just one of the four main disciplines within biomimicry, but biomimicry is inherently multidisciplinary, so many different disciplines can come in practice. Um, uh, is there is any program? Unfortunately, your audio was cutting out a little bit. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is there is any community program? Yes, I don't know off the top of my head um, where they all are, but yes, I know Arizona State University does have biomimicry PhDs um, as well. And I think there's some other around the world. I think um, there's a university in the Netherlands and um, Ohio. In Ohio, there's some work going on as well, too. And ASN 3.8 also provide e learning and biomimicry, like workshops, courses, etc. Yes. So I'm not sure about Arizona State University. All of the um, master's program for Arizona State University is online, so it's all e-learning. Um, but and so I don't know if they actually have separate courses that are not, I mean, that you can uh, go through if you're not actually a, a student enrolled. But there are other e-learning uh, through the Biomimicry Institute and Biomimicry 3.8, yes. Awesome, thank you. Okay, everyone, I think that's all we have time for today. But uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to email info at combio.org and I can go ahead and send those questions to Lindsay. Um, so thank you all so much for attending this and thank you so much, Lindsay, for doing this fantastic presentation. I definitely learned a lot. <laughs> I am so glad. I'm so glad that this resonated with your audience and I appreciate it. Again, I'm honored to share the message of biomimicry with you. And I do encourage you to continue to explore. And one thing that we always close our biomimicry presentations with is go outside. Go outside. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. And have a good uh, rest of your night, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you.